the Arena Football Hall of Fame has returned, and we want you to become a part of the family. Introducing the Arena Football Hall of Fame Patreon. Whether an all-star or a Hall of Famer, our reasonably priced tiers each have their own exclusive perks. Early access to the AFL Rewind podcast, honorary selection committee member, and much more. Help us build a Hall of Fame we'll all be proud of. Head to patreon.com slash AF Hall of Fame to join. Welcome to AFL Rewind, a look back at all things arena football, sponsored by Phenom Elite. I'm your host, Tim Capper. Every player seems to go through their own path when it comes to their career. Some are as simple as we would think that they would be, where you know they are they're they're drafted or picked up and then they have a have an amazing career. Some have a, are unfortunately are cut short by uh, by a, a major injury where they are not able to play anymore. And then there are some of those, I guess we can call them journeymen, where they make a huge name for themselves in the sport that they're playing, even though they may have played four, four, five, six, even more teams during their career. This episode, we have one of those players, a five-year alum of the Arena Football League, who was also given the nickname of America's quarterback by the commissioner of the Arena Football League at that time. We're going to be finding out about more of his story and why he was given that nickname when we speak with... JJ Rattering. With us on the podcast this episode is a gentleman who has quite a bit of history in the Arena Football League, not only in the AFL, but also in the AF2. And we want to hear about his his career, hopefully get some good stories out of him. Uh, on the line with us now is JJ Rattering. Hey, JJ, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it, Tim. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, the main thing is I'm thinking that we talked before on air uh, off air is that uh, that you're safe. That's the main thing, and that uh, uh, everybody does their part in order to hopefully curtail what the stuff that we're going through now. But uh, I think that that's the main thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're all going through it. And we're all we're all going to go through it and get through it together and figure it out together. So ex- that'll be a nice deal. Exactly. Exactly. Now, um, I mean, you were just about to, to start before uh, before I did the intro. We were talking. I'm going to go into your AF2 career, but let's get some background of. Uh, your football career before you got into the AF2. All right. So uh, I uh, played at the University of Wyoming from 2001 to 2004. Um, I was not drafted, but I did go to our pro day, uh, and I worked out for a few teams, uh, specifically the Seahawks, the Colts, and the Broncos. And the Broncos scout actually is the one who kind of turned me on to arena football, and he told me, he says, we're probably not going to be drafting a quarterback um, – any time here, uh, and he said, um, but, uh, you know, certainly not soon. And after the workout, he said, I've got some friends in the arena leagues. Would you ever entertain that? And I, I said, I, I've never even really heard of it. I've seen it on TV a little bit, but, you know, thank you. But, you know, I think I'll probably enter the workforce and, and move from there. So I graduated from college. I moved down to Denver. I worked for uh, Cronky Sports uh, mm-hmm. in the sales department for the Denver Nuggets and the Colorado Avalanche. And after one full month, and it was a two-month internship where you made 100 cold calls a day, uh, four days a week for two months straight, uh, I just I, I got about halfway through it, and I called my dad because I had fielded some calls from some arena teams, and I said, Dad, I'm going to go back and play football. And he said, well, where? And I said, I'm going to play this arena football because I keep getting calls. So maybe that's a sign that this is what I have to do. He said, do you know anything about it? I said, I know it's not cold calling. uh, And I know I'm not ready for the workforce. So that's about the extent of what I know. So I started getting into, uh, went to some open workouts. I really didn't know anyone. Uh, I didn't know anyone at a lot of them. In fact, I went to one for the Chicago rush down in, uh, it was in held in St. Louis Mm -hmm. and coach Mike Hoensey, who I ended up playing for, for a number of years. Um, I remember we did a couple of drills and, uh, I did one drill and I kind of screwed it up the way my footwork and everything. But when I made the throw, I made a a nice throw and he looked at me and said, never seen anyone do the drill quite like that, which was a nice (laughs) way of saying you completely butchered it, but great throw. And then, um, you know, he grabbed me afterwards and, 
uh, he kind of encouraged me if I wanted to do this to mm-hmm. get into the AF2. So uh, I was signed in Spokane to start uh, their inaugural season 2006. Uh, about a week before the first game, the head coach, Chris Siegfried, calls me and he said, I just don't think I can start a rookie. I know you want to start, but I know a team that would take you. And they traded me to Bossier Shreveport uh, down in Louisiana, played for John Forcade, the ex-New Orleans Saint mm-hmm. quarterback. Um, and I, to say that that team and that organization was patient with me would be a, a massive understatement. Uh, it took some time. Uh, there was a lot of us learning the game. We had a lot of fresh face rookies, but I'll just give you this, and this kind of uh, maybe – uh, tells people that maybe I didn't have quite the career, although it was only the only way was up. Uh, the third game I ever played, we're playing in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We end up losing seventy-two to three, Oy. and in the arena football, three's not a lot. And uh, so I remember there was a there was a ramp that if you got tackled uh, outside of the end zone, it was kind of leading up to the arena. And I, uh, I dropped back 44 times. I was on the ground, 27 of them, through five interceptions, um, nine or 11 sacks, whatever it was. But one of the times I was on the ground, we were it was myself and two defensive linemen. We were sliding down this concrete ramp that led to the arena or onto the field. And I won't forget there was uh, my face mask being metal was being pushed down to the ground. And the friction actually caused two little sparks to come up and two little sparks actually hit me in the face and the rest of the season in fact i was telling the story the other day the rest of the season my face mask had just a little bit of a chunk missing out of it (laughs) and uh the equipment manager uh jim would always say do you want a new face mask you know you got that little thing and i always told him no uh because when things ever got bad, it was just for that season. I, had, I obviously I had that one. But when things got bad, I always grabbed that little piece on the face mask, and I always thought it can never be worse <laughs> from a professional standpoint than that night in Tulsa. My yeah. parents came to the game. My sister came to the game. Uh, you know, we did have two touchdowns early get called back, so it could have been seventy-two to seventeen, I guess. But you know, we uh, I thought that there's just no way. But they hung in with me. Coach John Forcade hung in with me. Um, we ended up, we were actually, uh, if you can imagine, we were 0 seven at one point, we were playing Oklahoma city, which at the time they were six and one, mm-hmm. they had recently beaten Tulsa 90 to 54. So if you do the math, that's 46 points yep. plus the 69 points that the, I mean, if you did it like that, you know, it's over a hundred points there that ended up being our first win. Uh, we ended up beating them. Uh, we threw a touchdown in, uh, beat them by a couple of points. And from that moment on, I just realized that, one, football is funny and fickle. Uh, two, arena football maybe is even more so. You know, you've got the great equalizer mm-hmm. with the nets and the bar, and it was a completely different game. And when I first got into it, I, I would tell you that a lot of people say, well, you're looking for an opportunity to get up to either at the time Arena 1 or maybe the NFL or right. the CFL. That was the goal. Well, as time goes on, that kind of morphs into – you realize I've got such a limited window and yeah, I'm not, I'm not driving a brand new sports car to practice, but I'm still driving to practice to play football as my career. Right. So even though there's a a lot of guys who will tell you, you know, I was doing this for whatever reason, I, I learned shortly into the career that I was just going to live it out because a lot, I had one friend who said, well, don't chase the dream forever. And after a couple of years, I said, I am living the dream. I wake up, and I get to play football for a profession. Saturday night, I get to go in front of however many people it is. And, yeah, some games are on TV, some are not. Um, it may not be the lifestyle that you think of as a professional athlete, but it was still a lifestyle that fulfilled what I what I wanted and, and all my expectations uh, of continuing uh, to play. Now, you had that you had that. that chunk taken out of your face mask it's funny it's your battle scar for the battle wings did you did you keep that as a reminder to yourself or did you just get it fixed and or just it ended up getting tossed away that face mask um so i didn't need the the physical face mask um i i ended up giving it back i, I kind of wish now looking back on it, i had done it but i'll tell you the one thing um sliding down a concrete ramp with 600 pounds of 
<laughs> uh, human on you, and having two sparks hit you in the face yeah. leaves a pretty strong impression. So I, I did keep that memory. I keep it to this day when things are bad. I always think, man, I was trying to chase a dream there, and I it was I was living a nightmare at that time. So no, I wish I had. That would have been that would have been something fun, you know, and a fun keepsake if people come to the mm-hmm. house and you know ask about your career, but. Uh, I, I remember it so vividly that I could, uh, you know, I can just see everything about it. Um, and I, I do, now that you say that, it, it kind of makes me want to track down Jim, the old equipment <laughs> manager, and see see what the storage room or what a storage room down in Shreveport looks like. See if we couldn't track that down. Sure. Now, it's funny, you're also saying, too, that you were, you were doing cold calling for Cronky. At the time, the Colorado Crush existed. How did you not know about arena football, JJ? <laughs> so that's actually funny. So I took, when I didn't get drafted, I took the job. And before the job started, I actually had a two-day workout with the crush. Ah, okay. Um, and so I, I did, I went to a game. And the very first play I ever saw was Mark Grieb from the San Jose Sabercats, one of the all-time greats, threw, and I believe it was to James Rowe, uh, through just a quick slant that went 45 yards for a touchdown. And I, and I'm watching this and I'm thinking, well, <laughs> this is easy. All you have to do is throw hitches and slants and you score 90 points or 89 points, whatever they scored that night. And then I went to the two day workout and realized that, uh, it was completely different mm-hmm. and guys are flipping over walls and the timing and the throws and, and the things you do. So I had a quick indoctrination to that, even that two day workout. And nothing came of that, but I do remember where we were situated in the Pepsi Center was up in the press box. And that was, it was right at the end of May, beginning of June, uh, when we started. And we could actually oversee the whole arena, which at the time, the Nuggets and the Avalanche weren't playing. But the Crush, uh, that's the year they won the Arena Bowl, were playing. And so we would sit up there, make cold calls. And I would watch them practice. We would watch them practice. And so it all became kind of fortuitous because you're sitting there thinking, ah, I want to get in the workforce. And then all of a sudden, even though you're in the workforce, you just can't escape it. And there it is, literally right in front of you, mm-hmm. the guy's plan. And it just left that mark that you say, no, this, I, I've got too much desire uh, left. Uh, I don't know about talent, but too much desire, too much health. Uh, and, and, you know, too much uh to not give this a go and so that's really what kind of um was the the launching um you know the springboard excuse me uh that got me back into it do you think and and all honesty do you think you could have unseated john dutton not at the time (laughs) no no john was phenomenal yeah um and and certainly not in fact he helped me even the couple days i was there uh, just watching the throws i i had no I had no idea, and you kind of have to, especially a quarterback, you have to untrain yourself because there's some unorthodox things. You know, throwing off your back foot is acceptable, mm-hmm. and, and that touch pass. Uh, so, no. Now, the fortunate thing was, and it was kind of cool, even though it was in the arena leagues, you know, I got to meet John Dunn at the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, the AFL or Arena One, however you want to look at it, was, I guess just the AFL, um, you know, that was on NBC and ESPN on Monday night. So these guys – if you were in that circle, you definitely knew who they were. Yeah. And so I definitely did. And I got to compete against him a couple of times uh, after um, the league restructured in 2010. And so that was pretty special to uh, to play against John, not just because of what a fine player he was, but if anyone knows anything about him, he's a better human than he is a player. Mm-hmm. And he was a fantastic quarterback in the year in the oh, league for sure. for a while. Uh, now, I have to ask, too, because you, you're coming in uh, you're coming in from college where you're you're playing the, the normal 100-yard game. Uh, what was it like trying to get used to the arena game? How hard was it you, for you to get used to it? The very first, it's going back to the, um, uh, the workout. In fact, I got two quick stories on that because this is, tells you exactly what it was. The very first throw that I had in my two-day workout. Yeah was uh, what we call a sail in, which is like a, a short post from the high motion guy in the middle. And it was just warm ups. Well, um, in the arena game, if you're down by the goal line or really at any point, you take three steps and you throw it. Um, I heard short post. Someone said it's called a sail in. It's like short post. 
So Kevin McKenzie, who actually now I'm good friends with, was playing for the crush, ran the route. I took five steps, like what I am used to on a post from under center, took a quick little hitch through it, was extremely late, late enough to where he flipped over the boards. And, you know, they're like, hey, you got to throw that early. And, you know, I did not realize this. So, you know, I'm running down there. Are you okay? I'm so sorry. And he popped right up. He goes, no, that's fine. Just a little bit earlier next time. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? And then the very first pass for the uh, uh, Bozier Shreveport Battle Wings, we were against the Central Valley Coyotes um, out of uh, Fresno, California. And uh, it was basically just hitches, you know, 30 hammer. That's what everyone calls it, or 30 hitches, whatever you want to say. So I took three steps. I was trying to hit the high motion guy. They ran what's called cloud or two-corner coverage, which means – the cornerback from the field kind of uh, funnels in. He takes anything in the short middle, which is exactly where that hit route was. And I saw it late and almost threw a pick, and it would have been a pick six, to start my career. So um, I ended up throwing in the ground. It was incomplete. And I went, oh, man, this is – I thought this was eight on eight. I thought this was going to move faster uh, – or, excuse me, slower. It's much quicker. And after the game, my parents had come down. They said – my dad said, I was in your helmet with you mentally. I knew that this was, it, it, there was a lot of shifting and moving. And he said, I knew this was going to take some time for you to kind of adjust and, and see what it was. So um, I knew right away, it wasn't something that I could just watch and say, well, I could do that. Once you get out there, especially as a quarterback, it was a whole different yeah. uh, situation. What was it like being a, being a player under under Coach Norris in, in uh, Bossier Shreveport, considering he had huge ties to. He, he was almost like a, a an ori- you know a member of the original four. Yeah, well, I didn't actually play for Coach Norris. He came oh. in the year after, oh, okay. but he did. I, I did get to meet him. Um, he, you know, after that season, you know, you're on one year contracts and they have two. Yeah. After that season, he and I talked. He, I loved what he had to say. Uh, I really, and he turned it around, which I knew he would. Um, and I liked a lot of the things that he did uh, and was going to do. At the time, I just didn't go back. I had an opportunity to go to the Quad Cities, um, and so that was the opportunity I took, and uh, he always reminded me of that years yeah. afterwards. You know, well, he came here, but we became good friends uh, after, and he then was doing color commentary for the New Orleans Voodoo, um, you know, kind of towards the tail end of my career, so I would see him every time um, I would play New Orleans, but yeah, he was definitely one of the almost the founding fathers of the whole thing and certainly paved the way for a lot of guys. What was it like uh, going into the Quad City? Because uh, I think uh, Jim Foster, I think, had some ties to Quad City. Uh, and what's funny is in your career, you'll you'll you would have just been across the river, I think it was or, or wherever, uh, how close uh, Des Moines is. So we'll talk about that in a little, in a little bit. But what was it like playing for uh, for Quad City near the the end days of the AF2? Yeah, well, I loved, loved the Quad Cities. The people I met, I still have a lot of uh, friends, um, really close friends that live there and stay in touch with them. It was about, it, it was three of the best years of my life. I, you know, I moved there in the off season. Uh, just, I, I was there full time. I loved it. I loved the people. was really enjoying it. Uh, Jim Foster lived there in the Quad Cities, so I, we would see him often. In fact, I think I can't remember a home game that he wasn't at. <laughs> um, and so it was a great experience. And, you know, in the AF2, Quad Cities, you couldn't buy a ticket to get yeah. into one of the games the first couple of years. And I think it was 2000, 2001, mm-hmm. uh, those first few years when they were, um, you know, when they were back to back champions. Uh, and so I had a tremendous experience there and then like you said towards the end of the 2009 season we could see there was well that was the year that uh the afl or whatever you want to call arena one did shut down um and you kind of knew you said there's going to be a shift here we we hope and we think there's going to be arena football um but we're not sure what it's going to be and then the shift was a positive one where it kind of merged that those two leagues and yeah, financially for the players, it was not as lucrative, no. but it kind of gave some guys some opportunities. And then years later, they were able to, to make a little bit more playing there or, or get some looks. Uh, but it did um, kind of merge that whole thing. So 
the way it worked out worked out very nicely for for the league. That's good. Now I I know it's not AFL really. I just ask, what was it like playing in Fairbanks? Oh yeah, in the IFL. Yeah, that was funny. I it was Coach Sean Ponder, one of my old coaches, and um, I'm not even sure how we connected, uh, but he said, "Look, we've got one quarterback up here. Would you come up here? They have even." more um not obscure but they have different roles they can have two guys in motion yeah. and so that one there was some there was a learn i had another learning curve you know i've been doing this for four years and i had another learning curve uh in the indoor game but uh that was a that was a great experience again i met a lot of great people in the couple short months i was there but i do remember flying in i want to say it was june 21st june 22nd and it was right around the 24 hours of daylight oh, yeah. so uh, you know i'm sitting outside right now and it's, uh, you know, 5.30, almost you know, knocking on the door, 6 o'clock here. And this is about as dark as it was, and it was one <laughs> thirty in the morning. So uh, I had that adjustment, uh, but in the short time I was there, met some really, really good friends not only up there, but on that team. And uh, at first I was like, what am I doing? And then after all, I was like, this is a great experience. And that's I think that might also have been the time when you realize – it wasn't the end goal to just move up as fast as you could. It was the end goal to make every place you went to a little bit better than when you left it and just enjoy the heck out of the experience. And so that's what I tried to do. That's good. Yeah. And at, at any point, I mean, obviously you heard what happened to the to the league folding and stuff. Did you think that at that point your career may have been over? Um, you know, it's funny. Looking back, I never know. I, I knew that there was going to be an opportunity somewhere I knew there was going to be leagues there, and I knew I still had the desire to play. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, I, I didn't think my career was going to be uh, finished at that point. But I, uh, it was kind of an exciting time. You say, you know, what are you going to do? What is it going to lead to? And it ended up obviously working out really well. But, um, yeah, I was more focused on trying to get back to uh, where I wanted to be, um, and what I want to do, but I knew I wanted to still be around football. So that yeah. was really the main goal there. Okay. Uh, moving on to your AFL career, obviously you, you, you had a, I guess, was it a tryout or you were signed originally by Milwaukee and then you ended up with Chicago? Was that what it was? No. And I think that's, I'd have to check the old Wikipedia. I think Milwaukee's on there and I'm not sure how they got on there. Okay. Uh, Cause I was signed by Chicago. Um, when after, so after, uh, Alaska was the 2009 season right. that ended. They restructured, and Chicago is the only team, um, really, that I considered. Uh, I talked to a couple different teams, Shreveport being one of them. I uh, looked at Cleveland a little bit and then talked to Coach Hoensey, um and went over to Chicago and had, again, I, I, I could just rave about everywhere I was, uh, but uh, unbelie not only an unbelievable experience, but... I met people there that allowed me to extend my career because mm -hmm. I met a fellow who uh, owned a company that was a national company, and we we got along well. Uh, he actually had the other quarterback on the roster, Russ Mickna, working for him, and he ended up hiring me. I worked for that company for better than seven years oh, wow. while still playing football, and he let me play in Kansas City, Iowa. LA, Las Vegas, yeah. you know, you name it. Um, I was always employed by them. And uh, if it wasn't for them, I couldn't have financially at some point, I couldn't have justified it mm -hmm. um, just with what was going on back home of trying to take care of some things. Uh, but because of him and everything, I was able to do it. So um, some say he prolonged, some say he enabled the yeah. career, but it was, uh, it was certainly a blessing to, to meet him and to uh, to have that career extended. Now, you, you mentioned it, and I, I've been asking this as, you know, people are, are curious because not, all, not necessarily all this information is available or people are willing to give it out. At that time in 2010, I mean, we know what the league was coming off of. We're, we're uh, in, uh, in 2008 where, you know, quarterbacks were coming off of six-figure contracts. As being a backup in the, in the new AFL, do you mind if I ask how much you were making? Four hundred dollars before taxes. Wow. Yeah, I remember it. Well, it was a it was a pay raise from your arena two days though, because <laughs> that was that was um, two hundred and fifty dollars if you won. Yeah. So it was a guaranteed double. There was no win bonus if I remember correctly the first year, um, but yeah, that was that was all it was was four hundred dollars 
and if you're in the city of Chicago, four hundred dollars gets you. Um, it gets you enough time at a parking meter, and then if you stay too long out, it gets you just enough money to pay the ticket after you <laughs> left your car at the parking meter. But uh, again, it was all for the experience at that point. What was it like being a player under Coach Ho? Because a lot of people know. I mean, he started off. He was the, you know, he started off in the original four. He threw the very first touchdown pass in league history. He made a huge name for himself, being you know an assistant coach and then a coach with the Albany Firebirds. What was it like being under Coach Ho? Incredible. Um, he that first year, I remember calling home, and my dad said, "I've never seen you so happy." And I'm sorry, you got my nephew getting in here on this on the Zoom or the Skype call. Um, uh, the um, he, I called, I would call home, and my dad said, "I have never heard you this happy before." And uh, Coach Ho and see, I learned so much as I pursue now my coaching career, um, not just the X's and O's, the way to handle uh, the players. He was so genuine, and I will not forget, we started out 4-0, and and then we went up to Milwaukee. We had a really good team. We lost. We came home. We played Iowa um, and did not play well, and we lost. In fact, if I remember, it was like 44-30. to We didn't score many points. Just How you enough. remember that is beyond me, JJ. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know why. You could look it up because I could no, that's be wrong, per, No, that, that's exact. That's exact. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember that. And uh, so we lost. And I remember going in on Monday to pick up the game plan for the next week. And he... You know, he was sitting there, he was chatting with the guys, and he, and he did after the game. After every game, he would go by and shake every player's hand, no matter wow. what. Um, you know, and I remember talking to him once. We were out, I think we were helping at a, a, a clinic once, and we were driving there, and we were talking just about family, you know, talking about uh, raising a family and how you do it. And he always said that one of the things is he said he always told his kids, uh, no matter what the day looked like, I love you at the end of the evening. And I always realized that's what he's doing for us with the handshake uh, was basically saying, I appreciate you. Uh, you know, you guys um, were in this together and no matter what happened, win, lose or draw, he never flipped over a table or a, a jug of Gatorade and some guys do it and it works well. Uh, and he, he would elevate his voice, but it's it just, he had such a way of reaching us. I just, I respected, I respected all the coaches and they all had different attacks, but when you ask about Coach Hoensey in particular, the way he treated us, and because he knew that getting angry, we felt just as bad. If you threw an interception to lose a game, you felt you know, worse than anyone else on the team. And so I think he appreciated that, he understood that, and he treated the players um, with that respect that uh, you know that he would like to be treated with as a player as well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm sure as a, as a young quarterback, it's it, that's... It is. It's good to be in that type of environment because people may think of if you're, um, you know, a quarterback in minor league football or, or semi pro, whatever you want to call it, the AF two was at the at the time. Uh, yes, you're getting paid for it, but it's just a matter of how you are able as a quarterback to grow. And I yeah. think that, and that's that's what Coach Owens was able to to help you with. Yeah, not only physically because a lot of the the drills he did were very specific to the arena leagues and very beneficial, but you know, mentally, um, and I think. I think one of the things about Coach Owensy, if you said, what's the thing that you remember the most or you got from him, mm-hmm. um, not not X's and O's, because he, he had some of the best um, red zone offenses, you know, you the plays and the schemes and stuff, and everyone will tell you that. He had some great stuff down there. Um, but I one of the things I saw was how he genuinely enjoyed the, um, the potluck that is in a, a locker room uh, of any sport, but especially football, where you get a guy from, you know, maybe a guy comes from either privilege or a guy comes from not such a great background. Um, and he used to love, I used to sit there and watch him. Uh, he would watch the interaction, the dynamic of the locker room, and just he loved what everyone brought to the table. Mm-hmm. You could see he enjoyed the guy that made, you know, that came from this background or that background and how they interacted. And so, it kind of made me realize, um, not that you don't, but you realize you're like, this is so cool that I get to meet these people that, you know, I may end up going and visiting these guys someday and going to their families. Um, and there's going to be a complete cultural, uh, uh, difference, yeah. but 
we'll have the shortest bridge and gap to it because it's going to be it's it's going to be we're going to learn from each other but also appreciate each other. I think Coach Hohensee probably demonstrated that as well as anyone as I've ever seen. So Rust Mickna goes down uh, second to last game, and then you get your first start uh, of your career of your AFL career. Yeah. What what was what was the feeling like going? I'm mean, now mind you, yes, it was the last last game of the season. You guys are having a very good season too. On top. Well, of I can back you up a little bit because the first start yeah. was when Russ went to the OTAs for the UFL at the time, the United Football League. There we go. Okay, and that was uh, June nineteenth. We played Milwaukee, and uh, that score I remember sixty three to fifty six. <laughs> um, that one was pretty special. I had some friends who I called said, "Hey, I'm going to get a start here." And they said, well, we want to come see you. We want to come see Chicago. So they booked a flight. So they came out, and uh, we got down 28-7. to And that was a really good Milwaukee team. They had Chris Grison at quarterback, Tiger Jones, Nate Force, uh, Damian Harrell at wide receiver. Uh, the defensive line was phenomenal at the time. Um, I think Kareem Smith was on that team. Tyus Jackson was a, uh, the Mac. They just were you know, I could go on. That was a great team. Yeah. Yeah. We were down 28 to seven. I just remember looking at the scoreboard going, this is not how I envisioned this first start going here. <laughs> and again, with coach Owensy, you didn't, you, you just didn't really panic. You didn't think about it in those terms. And I, and we just kind of slowly crept back in. Uh, if I remember right, uh, Chris Martin, uh, made an interception, uh, Dewan Alfonso, I know, made the interception because he took it back, and that was ended up being the winning uh, score for us. Um, but I even remember Coach Hohensee's uh, young son, Little Mike, uh, was on the bench with us. I think he was 9 or 10 at the time. And he kind of looked at his dad. I remember this, and he said, Dad, we're tied when it got to 42. And, uh, you know, and, he, and his dad just kind of smiled like he'd been around the game so long. He knew. He knew there was a lot of time left. So, yeah, that was my first start. Um, and then getting to what you were saying, uh, and then after that, you know, Russ came back and I went back to being the backup and, and didn't really uh, play a whole lot, uh, until we were playing Dallas and right before halftime, uh, I think it was his ribs. He broke his ribs yeah. and, um, I went in, uh, finished the game. Uh, it did not end, uh, kind of an dubious ending there, uh, as I, we, it was overtime. They scored, kicked an extra point. We got the ball, took it down to about the five-yard line or so. I ended up throwing um, uh, a pick six, which ended it, which it didn't matter. As soon as he picked it off, the game was over, uh, less me getting a fumble and returning it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, again, just another positive uh, aspect of Coach Owensy. We went in, instead of watching the film on Monday – the only play he had on there was the end of that um, of that uh, game, which was uh, he showed the team. He said, "This is the guy that's going to lead you into the playoffs." And it was me running because even though the game was over, I tried to run the guy down. Right. You know, maybe out of frustration after throwing the pick, um, and I obviously didn't catch him. <laughs> he was a lot faster. <laughs> Probably still is today. And uh, but anyways, I, he took the positive of that, which I ended up using the same uh, similar example as I was coaching high school. The exact same situation happened to our quarterback, and I was able to empathize instead of just sympathize with them based on my experience. Um, but yeah, so we ended up losing that one. Then we went to Spokane, which is one of the coolest environments. Oh by yeah. Far. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Tim. Sixty-three to forty-nine. Dude, man. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I. I, I well, because we were back and forth, and I think we were tied at 49, and uh, we were going, if I remember right, we were going in, and uh, I left, we, we got down inside the five, and I just short-armed a little, you know, back of the corner, uh, flash route, or however you want to call it, and Antoine Marsh ended up jumping up and picking it off from the Jack linebacker position, and uh, and they ended up, I think, scoring, or they ran up the clock, but they scored right at the end. Um and uh, so that was that game. But, yeah, then we then we went and we played Milwaukee again, who had had the first start. And I remember we were supposed to play. It got, even though they won the division, I think at 11-5 and five or 12-4, and four, whatever they were, we were 10-6. and six. Something was happening with the Bradley Center, and they almost put us, they almost let us have a home game, but then they ended up uh, switching, and Milwaukee hosted, and we played in an arena right across the street. 
Um, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, same thing. We were close. Um, and then just right at the end, couldn't punch it in. Um, and that was kind of the end of that season, but, uh, it was, it was a great ride the first season. And, you know, I've said it multiple times there, but I learned a lot from that coaching staff because not only did you have, um, uh, Mike Owensy, you had, uh, Bob McMillan, who ended up being one of my head coaches mm-hmm. uh, the next year. Uh, Scott Bailey was the player personnel director, uh, who I ended up standing in his wedding and he and I are, you know, still really good friends. And so, uh, the people I met and the experiences out of that year in Chicago were were second to none. Yeah, and you started off in 2011 with with the rush also, but you ended up going. Yeah, were you tr- you were traded or were you? Re- what, how did you get to Kansas City for in 2011? No, I I started in Kansas City. Oh, you did. In okay, 2011. Yeah, I they called me and they said we're starting a team down here. Um, we're looking for a face of the franchise. I don't. I will not forget. Coach Bardo said that. Um, I was. I remember exactly where I was. I was uh, working for that company that I'd met in Chicago. I was in Louisiana doing work for them. And uh, I was in a meeting, and I said, i got to step out and take this. It was uh, Coach Bardo, and he said, we're looking for the face of the franchise. We're going to give you um, and I'm try- the marketing player. Okay. Uh, the marketing player got $1,000 a game as opposed to the 400 from everyone else. So he said, there's three of them. We're going to give you one of those. Um, and uh he said you know we're we're looking to have a guy here i went there and uh we actually had a pretty good team uh we were in some games but we just could not finish them and uh it and then russ ended up getting hurt back in chicago and i was good friends with those guys and we started talking i said look we're not going to make the playoffs i think they want kind of want to see maybe another guy they want to see what else is on the roster at this point yeah and bob said we are going to the playoffs and Russ is hurt. We would trade for you in a heartbeat. And, um, it was a very, there was no animosity, really good feelings among all of myself and the both teams, you know, all three parties felt like they got a win. I got to a team that was going to the playoffs. They got a quarterback that they knew in Chicago, Kansas city got to see, um, you know, somebody else, uh, kind of towards the tail end of their season. So I ended up there and then we were, um, we went down to Arizona, and uh, I'll tell you this one, 54 to 48, and I won't forget that because uh, with six seconds left, we were down 54-41, threw in a touchdown. We decided not to onside. We decided to kick off, mm-hmm. and Chris Gould, who actually coaches here for the Broncos, one of my really good friends, uh, instead of onsiding and going for the Hail Mary, placed it perfectly off the bottom of the net. And it ricocheted back. Uh, they had Virgil Gray back there, one of the really outstanding middle uh, defensive backs uh, during my day. Um, and it just came off really fast, and it kind of caught him off guard, went by Virgil, and Charles Dillon for us was running down. And all, all, if he, it just kind of happened fast, and he got a bad bounce, and he almost just caught it, took two steps, and you know, then we hold him, we go to the Arena Bowl. And... Uh, the ball got kicked into the end zone, barely. And when I say barely, barely scrapes the wall. It's a touchback. They run the clock out, and uh, we go home. They go. They end up hosting Jacksonville, uh, who ended up beating them on the last play. Um, but uh, yeah, we were. I always tell people, I, you want to talk about a game of inches. We were. If that ball had, had bounced an inch before where it did, it's probably a clean hop to Charles Dillon. And, uh, you know, I, I at least have we, we got a shot at the Arena Bowl in 2011 there. Yeah. Why? Um, How did you end up being? You know, it's funny. You, you're heading home, so to speak, where your career kind of began in 2012. How did you how did you end up with the uh, with the Iowa Barnstormers? So after the uh, 2011 season, um, Russ actually was healthy. And so they we I talked about <laughs> we talked about about both uh my nephew wants in we talked about both of us um maybe staying there and doing some things uh but that's when coach hoency ended up going to iowa Mm -hmm. and you know russ and i talked about it a lot and he said well you know we both kind of came to the conclusion that a quarterback controversy of any sort uh was not what either of us wanted so he said you know i said look i can go to iowa um, I can, I can start there. You can start here. 
And that was also the year that they restructured and uh, quarterbacks made 1675 a game as opposed to the 400 that everyone made. So okay. if, if you were the starter, you had to yeah, start yeah. the game. And so Russ and I said, that's a lot of money um, to leave on the table. Uh, and so that played a little bit, you know, comparatively speaking in professional sports. Uh, but for the time, it was a lot of money. Uh, and so we we kind of both talked about it. But, you know, a chance to get reunited with Coach Hohensey, uh And I was able to get a couple of guys I played with, Marco Thomas being one of them, mm-hmm. uh, Jesse Schmidt, who I played with in Arena 2, um, to get and, and that environment. I mean, Des Moines was one of the most fun places to play. Uh, the cowbells and and everything there at Wells Fargo Arena. So it was a it wasn't too difficult of a choice. It was pretty enticing. I love Chicago. Wanted to stay if the opportunity was there, but you know that this just happened to be the one that kind of presented itself um, and and worked out phenomenal. I, I wouldn't trade anything for the years that I had in Iowa. Now it's uh, it's very refreshing to hear because you know in, in you know pro sports you usually hear when as you said uh, quarterback controversies a guy is going at it supposedly just to to be the starter and then you hear the story between you and Russ it 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 just blows my mind to hear that you can have two guys who are well known in the AFL want, both wanting a starting job and, and one saying you know what I'm going to go here how about you go here that, I mean it, yeah. it's it, it, it's, it's refreshing to hear when uh, you know we could usually hear of rivalries and stuff like that and bad blood. Yeah, there, there wasn't any. No, and and you know, had had that been the case, if we said, hey, look, um, and it's different than the NFL, you know, obviously financially and some of the other things. But had it been the case that both of us um, would have competed, we we would have stayed as good of friends as we are today. Uh, we would understand. You understand that it's not my call who the starter is; it's the head coach's. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was one of those things you could work out. You say, well, you know, this, again, that speaks to the mindset of um, the uh, um, <laughs> the fact that, sorry, my, it's okay. my nephew just gave me a plastic hot dog and a hamburger and wanted, wanted to be compensated for it as, as my waiter. <laughs> um, but you, uh, again, that was getting back to the point where I said, I'm focused on the enjoyment factor and realizing this is kind of a journey. Mm-hmm. And now I write a new chapter and a new team and a new city. And you kind of, if you, if you don't take that mindset, you might drive yourself crazy. But for me, it helped me just uh, really stay living in the moment of just like, this is, I, I've got such a short window, you know, where I can do this. And it's like, I can go work and get another full-time job anytime I want. I won't be able to do this very long. I want to maximize it. I want to go everywhere, see everything. Uh, do everything I can so that way 10, 15, 20 years down the road and my head, head hits the pillow, I go, that was one heck of a ride. I sure am glad I did everything I did. For those who, who never got a chance to to see a game, and I'm one of them, I never got a chance to see a game in Iowa, explain to explain to the, the people that are listening what it's like to play in Iowa and what these fans are, how crazy these fans are. One, they do their homework. Uh, so if you're a visiting fan and you've got uh, an ex-girlfriend and or something, uh, something fun in your past that they can dig up. They will. Uh, they're an educated fan base. Um, the cowbells. Uh, you know, in fact, it's funny. I, my my nephew, I keep talking about here. He he found a um, uh, a little black towel. So we used to do almost like the terrible towels in, of Pittsburgh. Uh, so I found one of those. But the cowbells. The um, the cowbells were absolutely i mean it made it hard even when we were warming up and people are doing i was like can't imagine being a visitor even though i have been one here um a just a raucous crowd but guys used to this is the energy of what arena football is and this is what makes it so much fun so um unfortunately guys said i kind of get up for the games here even a little bit more i think well don't especially if you're a d lineman don't get too up for it but um you know, it was it was fun, I think, for the visiting fans, but definitely the visiting players. Um, and the other thing was, I would see all the time, you talk about visiting fans, our crowd there, they're Midwestern folks. They were phenomenal people. You know, these are the type of people that you meet them for five minutes and they're inviting you to, uh, to dinner with their kids and, yeah. and to do those things. And so, um, thanks, buddy. Uh, they, they would do that. And so I would hear stories of, visiting fans going tailgating 
uh, with our fans before the game. And, uh, you know, and then you look on like social media and they were lifelong friends. So uh, Iowa was, a, like I said, just a phenomenal place to play. Yeah, and you're talking about fans, and I, I, I can't be remiss if I didn't, uh, you know, at least talk about Slasher as an example. <laughs> Got to talk about Slasher. Got about Slasher because uh, yeah. Scott Scott is a unique gentleman, and uh, I know he was a he was a huge super fan for the uh, for the for the Barnstormers. Well, and he covered I-35 between Des Moines and Kansas City because he would go to both. You know, he'd go to all the command games and and that he could, and all the Barnstormer games that he yeah. could. Um, were you disappointed in your time? I mean, you, you, I think you were, you had two losing seasons in Iowa before you headed off to LA, which we'll talk about. Um, were you disappointed in how the teams were? Um, no, th- there was no disappointment. I was disappointed that we, uh, felt like we left some wins on the table and I don't, I don't know if you want to say underachieved. Um, but what was disappointing was we got off to pretty good starts, you know, in 12, we ended up beating Spokane in Spokane, uh, in overtime. Um, and you know, I think that season started promising. Then we came home, we ended up losing to Utah. Um, but you know, they were kind of up and down. I, I was disappointed we never got into the playoffs because yeah. that city and that team deserved that. Um, but that would be, uh, I wouldn't be disappointed in anything there except for the fact that we just didn't get. We didn't put the wins up there that we should have. I think we had the players. Uh, we just didn't get, a, you know, a couple of bounces here and there. I can think of just one or two things here and there that all of a sudden changed the face of a game, kind of changed change, change the face of a season. But, you know, you look at some of the things we did. Uh, that season we did beat Arizona. We did beat San Antonio uh, after they were on a nine, ten-game win streak, whatever they were on. Um and, you know, we had Chicago. You know, it took them to overtime at our place. Should have beat them. Uh, so there was – there was, we were there. Uh, Utah, 63-62. to 62. I won't forget that game, you know, how we should have won that. I, I just – I look at that and I think, you just flip. We were 7-11. You flip four games. We're 11-7 and seven and we're in the yeah. playoffs there. And, and we were in a tough, tough conference with Utah, Chicago, San Jose – uh, San Antonio, Arizona. I mean, right then, if you go back and look at those teams and those rosters, those were not easy games. None of them really were in the league, but those were tough, tough games. And we were right. We beat some of those teams. And we were right there with them. Um, so, you know, even Arizona at their place, fifty-four to forty-eight. Does that sound right? Yeah, uh, I, I, I have not. Yeah, I thought it. you maybe added up to. Yeah. yeah, but anyway, so no, I wasn't. I wasn't disappointed. Um, but it was it was too bad we couldn't at least get a playoff game, especially a home playoff game there. That place would have been electric. Ah, yeah. uh, so glad to get out of that dang time travel machine. Where'd you go? I went back to the 80s to grab some of that good, good sports merch from my favorite defunct franchises. I spent my life savings on that machine. You bought a time travel machine to buy sports merchandise. Yeah, gladly. You know you could have gone to 503 Sports, right? The the website? Uh, yeah, no, I didn't think of that at all. Yeah, they sell all sorts of throwback sports merch from leagues like the World Football League, XFL, UFL, and the Arena Football League, several others. Uh, oh, shoot. Yeah, they sell hats, shirts, even custom jerseys from all sorts of vintage sports teams. Oh, man, I spent, like, a lot of money on that time travel machine. Well, look, listeners of AFL Rewind get 10% off their first order by using the promo code ARENAFAN at checkout. That might help you out. Yeah, it does. Go on over to 503-sports.com and, and get your merch today. Do you know anyone who wants to buy, like, a overpriced time travel machine? No, no, sorry, I, I don't. And then the next year, you, you end up playing for your first team that happens to be opened by a, by a, a musical group. Um, how, how, did you, how did you end up in L.A.? Scott Bailey, who I referred to uh, earlier um, in Chicago, uh, called me. I was in Reno, still working for the same software company. I'm out of Chicago. Um, called me and said, uh, and said, we are thinking uh, we're... Uh, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley are buying a team. I said, yeah, I heard that. And, and I was actually in a meeting, and he kept uh, he kept calling me. And I thought, guys, i got to step out. And so I did. And I said, and he said, uh, we're about to trade for you. Will you come? I said, what? And he said, we're Bob's the head coach. 
I'm the player personnel director. We're going to trade for you. Are you going to, will you come to LA if we do? I said, uh, yeah. And, uh, Tim, I'm going to go inside for you yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, we're getting some wind. Uh, we're going to have a little storm here. Um, but Scott said, uh, he said, yeah, he said, we're, we're going to do it. If I, if I do this, will you, uh, come to LA? And I kind of hesitated and I said, uh, yeah, I'll do it. And, he said, okay, great. I'll call you later with the details, but I got to go now. I got to get this in before the expansion draft. And I kind of hung up and, and I stood there and I thought, what did I just agree to? What did I do? <laughs> and I called my dad and uh, I said, well, I'm moving to LA. And he said, you know, to be a, what are you going to do? You're going to be an actor or something? I told him, he said, wow. He said, normally we talk about these things before. And I said, yeah, I, I didn't really have time. And uh, so I'm sure you have more questions, but that's that was the initial part of how I ended up there. Well, I got to I got to ask, too. I mean, it's I, I know you ended up getting traded a little bit later on. But I mean, uh, how was how were Paul and Stanley and the guys as an ownership group? Because I've heard thing po- very positive things about them as as an ownership group. Yeah, they, they were. Um, they it was all new to them. I, I think the one thing that I saw them realize was there's a there's a pretty big distance between a scripted um, concert where you miss a note, you miss something here or there. People go home, they're really not judging you. There's really no outcome to it. They were entertained and they're good. When you have a, uh, you know, they had the entertainment piece down down there, but when there's wins and losses on the line, um, and if you make a mistake in this, you know, people will certainly judge you. But then you've also got a um, you know, answer to that with a win and loss. And I think they saw that they saw that it was a little bit different, um, than, than what they were used to in the entertainment business. Um, and so it was, you could kind of see that shift, uh, in their, in their thinking or their approach to it. Uh, but they were, it, it, they were incredible because there was days that there was some days, two, three days in a row, we would have lunch with them or we'd be doing a photo shoot or something for the show out there. And, you know, I'd call home and talk to my friends and say, yeah, I did something with Paul and Gene today. And one of my friends says, I love how you talk about these guys like that we went to high school with them. You know, <laughs> go Paul and Gene. And, uh, but they were. They, w- once you got to know them, they were, um, you know, they were really regular guys, had some really good conversations um, with both Gene and Paul. And you, uh, and then you kind of, uh, you sit there and you're like, well, these guys, you know, certainly – have paved a pretty good path for themselves but um at the end of it they also appreciate what we're doing and what we're trying to do and they're also trying to help us out with that so it was really fun getting to know those guys and and uh have them be a part of the journey what we, and everybody knows about la and what they did you got the you had the, you had the women in the cages you had the silver turf you had you had your uh your 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 scripted tv show um uh-huh. I, I had to ask, tell us about Fourth and Loud. I mean, how how was it a was it cool to be in, or was it just did, at one point it was like I'm I'm a football player. I I don't want to do a WWE type of vignette. Yes and yes. Um, you know, <laughs> at first when you go out there and you know we moved out in February or March, whenever it was, and it's 75 degrees every day, and you get out of practice and. Yeah, you know, they're putting a microphone on you and say, hey, we're going to do this. And you're like, wow, my friends are going to and family are going to see me on a reality TV show. And, you know, some of the guys thought they were going to get their own spinoffs like uh, the Jersey Shore folks. And and so you do you kind of get caught up. You're like, this is really fun. This is really cool. And then uh, after a while, when you're losing, uh, you're trying to be nice about it. But you're like, this is a little invasive. I'm trying to figure out how we can get some wins here uh, so that this show is going to be worth watching. Yeah. Um, but it, you understand that was part of it. And and I think looking back on it now, um, you were so caught up in everything and maybe even the pressure of how are you going to be portrayed that if I ever had the opportunity to do it again, uh, I would focus on really trying to make people understand try and make, make sure that the league was in the, the best light that it could. So you didn't really, not so much sacrifice yourself, but you didn't really um, focus on you. You focused on what made the show not only entertaining, but 
you know, let people know the league is not a joke. There's very high quality players, guys that have been in, uh, should be maybe still in the NFL. And so I didn't want it to come off as like, um, you know, the movie semi pro is, is kind of a, a shtick comedy like that. I wanted people to say, this is entertaining and there's some really good players there. You know, when you don't win the games, like we weren't winning, um, uh, you know, people maybe question some of the validity of it, but um, overall, I, I look back and it's fun to talk about. It's fun stories. There were days it was tough because you were worried about how you were going to look uh, when the whole thing came out. But at the end of it, you know, it's fun. I've got one friend here in Denver, and when she introduces me to people, she always says, "This guy was a reality TV star," and I, <laughs> I kind of have to adjust their expectations or the definition of a reality tv star at that point yeah i i, I have to ask too did because if i remember correctly they tried to give this weird storyline to your kicker kenny spencer did they ever come and try to do a certain particular storyline with you where you said no 100 <laughs> percent um what they tried to do was they said we're gonna have some fun with you we're gonna make you late to practice well we were one and one we had lost in Orlando in overtime, and we should have won that game, uh, but we didn't. And what they did is they tried to create a scene where, because I was working my job at the same time, they tried to create a scene where I was um, I couldn't balance both work and football. And so they said, "We're going to make you late to practice and act like you, uh, you know, you came late because of your job." And I won't forget what we Scott and Bob were there and they set up this scene where um, I run out from behind a, a shed. I was hiding behind the shed. I run out from behind there and um, they come over and yell at me. And we had to do this like three or four times. And they said, you guys have got to quit laughing and quit. Um, you know, you, you've got to take this seriously. And Bob and Scott said, this isn't JJ. He wouldn't be late. He drives everyone to practice. He holds extra <laughs> film sessions. That's why we chose him to be the quarterback. And I, I remember I, I called the producer and I said, Chris, I got to be honest with you. I really am honored. I'd love to be a part of this. Um, but if there's going to be storylines like this that may come out negative, especially for my family, I, I really don't want to do this. And he was great about it. He said, no, we don't want to do that. You know, we just try and create some things there and i was like things will happen i said trust me this is arena football things will happen yeah. uh, and so he uh, um uh he was great and they kind of they they wrote that out of there um so it ended up working out well but yeah that was early on i was fortunate to say something so it didn't uh didn't really get out of hand at any point so they just let kenny spencer get involved with the cheerleader instead <laughs> You know, <laughs> if you want to do a podcast with Kenny, well, actually, I talked to you not too long ago. I'll, I certainly don't want to. Uh, I'll let him tell his side of the okay, story. No on, on how they portrayed that. Um, it was an interesting year for you. You weren't there in LA all that long. You, you just moved out to LA to play football, and then you get traded, and you went the the roundabout way to get traded. I think you you got traded in the, approximately in the middle of the season, where your rights went to. It was all between you and AG, uh, Aaron Garcia, because they wanted him, and they, just some mod modifications. You ended up going, your rights went through Jacksonville, so technically you were a Jacksonville shark for a, for a, um, a hot minute. Mm -hmm. And then you, then you ended up in Iowa. Yeah. Well, I, I originally I got traded to Iowa just because they um, their two quarterbacks actually were hurt there. And so they said, Coach Owens, he said, we're going to trade back. When I got back there, after all the pressure and everything was released, I knew his offense, I knew mm -hmm. the receivers, so um, fortunately was able to have some really nice games. Um, and then what happened was Aaron went out to L.A. Things didn't really change. It was just a lot going on. It was really tough for a lot of people to succeed, and, um, and we kind of talked about it. So then he even got a little nicked up, and they said, well, you know, maybe JJ, I even got a call and they said, well, turns out you weren't the problem. <laughs> and, uh, I said, yeah, I said, I'd love to come back. And so with Scott, we started orchestrating this thing and they did like a futures for futures type thing. And I believe if I remember right, I know it's Tom Goodhines, I uh, helped put it together. I think like I became, I was part of the Philadelphia soul, then the Jacksonville sharks, then back to LA. It, I, I, I 
you'd have to ask those guys how they orchestrated, how they did it, but they figured out a way to get me back there, which I really wanted for many reasons. One, I loved California, so I wanted to get back. Uh, two, my car was still there, and so was a lot of my the bulk of my job. Um, but three, I really wanted to try and rewrite the first part of the year, yeah. at least on a personal level, um, and show people there. It's like, I went to Iowa. I know I can still play. I want to come back here. I want to do it here where we started something um, and uh, came back. And, you know, we played well. We weren't able to get ourselves into the playoffs. But it uh, it worked out. It was it was talk about a roller coaster year. Um, yeah. It worked out really well. And I got to be honest, I didn't really watch the show, so I don't know how it looked on there. Uh, but I'm sure there's people that looked and said, wait, you can get traded in the back. I don't understand how this works. <laughs> Neither do we. And we're involved. So don't work. Don't feel too bad about it. Now, I don't know if you remember, because we, we put out something on arena fan, put out, out something on social media after I did some, some, some research when you were traded originally, uh, back to Iowa. And I was, we're talking between uh, week nine and week 10 of the 2014 season. JJ, you became the first Arena League quarterback to play the exact same team in in consecutive weeks. Cleveland that, Gladiators. The Cleveland yeah. Gladiators. Yeah. I there's a couple of someone told me one day there's a couple of um, I don't know if you want to call them records distinctions that I do hold in the Arena Leagues. Um, that's one of them mm-hmm. is that I was a quarterback against uh, the same team two weeks back to back. The other is. And I this may have changed, but I don't think it did. Um, I threw um, the first touchdown pass for more new franchises. Oh yes, I um, yes. Yeah, I, I I don't know if that still is, but I look at both of those and I think, well, I've got to hang my hat on something uh, one day to tell the grandkids. So um, that if that's it, that's it. But yeah, uh, we we were in Cleveland uh, again. Sh- 45 42 should have beat them and uh you know we had the ball in the 10 yard line with a minute left they had all their timeouts just didn't we didn't even score we didn't even punch it in it was crazy um and uh they went down kicked a field goal and then uh you know i i was sitting there we were on the beach actually on on monday we had had the day off and uh um, got a call from coach hoency and it said are you ready to get out of there and i was I can't remember. I think we were at Huntington and I'm looking around and I'm like, you know, it's 80 degrees. I got palm trees. You got, uh, this and that. And you're like, I'm not quite ready to go back, but okay. And, uh, yeah. So then they traded and I, I didn't even know. And I looked at the schedule and I went, they play Cleveland again. And, uh, (laughs) so we show up and I remember joking with all the guys. I was like, well, if you guys want to watch any film from last week, I'll, uh, I can give you probably the best insight to exactly what I saw and exactly what we were thinking. So, yeah, one of the uh, one of the fun times uh, in my career. And you and you actually ended up playing Cleveland four times that year. Four times, yeah. I got uh, I saw them once uh, in LA, once in Iowa, twice there. So yeah, I, they the little restaurant across the street. I think it's called the the Winking Lizard. I think is what it's called. <laughs> Yeah, and I got to know that place pretty well. It's right across the street from the arena there. Uh, 2015, as I mentioned before, you get to play for your second team that's owned by another rock star. I'm sure there are so many stories considering just what we saw with this team and how it started off with the very first home game and the rumors of your how your owner sang the national anthem. Anyways... <laughs> um, yeah, no, he uh, he did. Yeah, he did. You probably um, did too. But how is it playing in Vegas? Because everybody, everybody who followed the league knows there were some, there were monetary issues in Vegas. There, there have been. Now, to be fair, there have been monetary issues before with yeah. other teams in the league, and it's no, no, nobody's known about it. I'll give Chicago is a great example of an owner that should not have been an owner, right? But, what were your thoughts on being the first? How did you get to Vegas? And then what were your thoughts on the ownership group in Vegas? Well, I got there through Aaron Garcia. You know, he and okay. I got to know each other in LA when he was hurt. He essentially became the offensive coordinator. And so he and I worked together uh, and we did really well. And uh, so he got the head coaching job. So LA just, again, 
I think a lot of us just said this didn't quite work out like we thought. So a few of us went different directions. So I, I went there to, to Vegas with Aaron. Um, and as far as the ownership group, anytime you're trying to put a new team together, it's so difficult. There's so much to it. you got to secure the arena. You've got to get meals for the guys. You've got to get living. You've got to do all these things. And it's there's so much more that goes into it. And I... I feel for the guys that try, and I appreciate the heck out of the fact that they do. They put their necks out there to try and make it work, but um, they they just won't get to everything in a few short months. So they tried, um, and then whatever happened, some of the backings I don't know, but I know some people uh, kind of stretched themselves as thin as they could to try and make the thing go uh, that were involved with it. And then you know there was some finger pointing and some things, and when that happens, it becomes a uh, really tough for the players if they know that there's dissension in the ranks um it becomes a topic of discussion in the locker room and it becomes something that's a distraction so uh, that's if you can get everything set and you don't have any of those issues it helps the players prepare and unfortunately in vegas you know maybe it was a little rush that they tried to do some things um and it just did never really the pieces never really came together fully on it in your opinion, as as a pro, was was that your worst ever ownership group that you played for? You know, I had some good ones, so the bar was set probably pretty high. Yeah. Um, but that one probably because one of the owners I'm still actually friends with, um, and again, he's someone who stuck his neck out there and tried to make it work as best he could. Um, so, you know, to say the worst, I think they faced – they probably faced the most challenges and the fact that, um, you know, we didn't, we weren't allowed to compete in the playoffs because, uh, we didn't pay our league dues. You know, they, they probably, I'm sure they wish they could have figured that out. And so that was unfortunate. Um, but I know there was a lot of people who did everything they could to try and make it work and then it just kind of fizzled out. So it was disappointing. Uh, again, a good team, uh, did qualify for the playoffs, not with a great record, but we did qualify. Um, uh, but again, I think in the middle of the season, without some distraction, the team probably the record looks different. The team looks different. Um, as a player who puts you know their heart and soul into a team, especially being the guy that you know, I'm sure that a lot of the players will look at and look to because you are the quarterback. Uh, how are you guys told about you guys being? not basically taking the, the playoffs taken away from you and how did how did how'd you react we knew it um going into the last game against spokane and uh i actually saw coach cruisenberry the o-line d-line coach for spokane and uh he even said we, we had heard the rumblings that we hadn't paid our dues the league was not gonna support us playing in the playoffs and he confirmed it. he said yeah it's pretty much official um and i and we all knew it. And I remember after the game, we ended up losing, but I remember Aaron was sitting there in the locker room just looking almost lost. Like, you know, what do I say to these guys who worked so hard and thought they were going to play and get another, you know, another uh, game check and hopefully get three more games and, and make a run at the arena ball here. And um, so it was it was kind of you, – you had time to prepare because we had known for a while. We knew there were some financial strains. And, yeah. You know, the New Orleans game got canceled. Um, about to ask you about that. Yeah. yeah and, and so once that happened, then you kind of had an idea. You're like, mm, everything is on the table as far as repercussions for some of the things here. So we're – and we can't control it as, as, a, as a player or as a team. So we didn't really um, – you try not to let it folk, uh, become a focal point. But when you're lifting and running and practicing, it's in the back of your mind. You're thinking, I'm doing this. And maybe I'm doing this to put myself on film for next year for another team or something. Uh, not that teams don't know almost everything about you at this point, but yeah. you know, at this point, you say, "Well, I'm, I want to do this because I want to make sure I'm I'm proud of my effort and everything." But uh, it we we got a slow uh, introduction to it, so we kind of knew that was on that was on the way. You mentioned it before, and uh, you know the New Orleans game was canceled. It was the only, <laughs> it's the only game ever that was canceled in league history. There's another claim to fame for yeah, you. I was going to say, I just just keep racking them up. I would love for it to be in <laughs> arena bowl titles or uh, you know touchdowns or, or yards or something in the league for a year. But uh, yeah, well, you know what? You, you take them where you can get them. 
how i mean was it something you guys knew after the los angeles game that the game wasn't going to be played because obviously you had to travel it was going to be a, it was going to be a home game um new orleans would have to travel out but you know this this just i guess for a lot of fans it was just looking at how people were you know thinking what they were about about the vegas franchise because we heard about the issues with the uniforms at the beginning of the year we heard about those horrible wanted whatever they were wanted jerseys yeah. you guys had to wear one game yeah i mean there was people that there was people that took those after they bought them the the after the jersey auction i think they went camping with some of those uh things the way they fit on your <laughs> on your shoulder pads but um yeah there was a lot of issues so as far as the new orleans game i won't forget we again we all knew about it and after that game we stayed there that night and by the hotel there was a little denny's uh, or an ihop I can't remember which one, but we went over there and a bunch of us, I was with Tyson Poots and mm-hmm. we kind of looked at each other and uh, Tanner Varner was there and we're like, mm-hmm. and I think Joe Mortensen was with us and we said, yeah, we're not playing next week. Like we just knew it and uh, we'd heard the rumblings and you could just feel it and uh, that was really disappointing. So, yeah, to be a part of a canceled game for that reason was uh, yeah. was crazy, but really disappointing. Um, you, you then look at your career i mean you you had we're gonna have to talk about you playing in china because it, i i knew you i'm sure you had a hell of a lot of fun and i think uh, former arena arena fan co-host of mine adam markowitz i think was there also if i'm not mistaken um t- you gotta tell me about playing in china man that we'd need a whole nother segment of the podcast for all the stories <laughs> but i i think the overall theme for that was um The cultural differences were, we talked earlier about kind of that melting pot of a locker room. You want to talk about a completely different one and a dynamic that none of us had ever reached, not really with that language barrier, but also, and I even said, I said, this is, they've, they've been raised completely different than, than a lot of us have. And, and so football is, is very foreign. And what I mean is this is a country who built a wall to mm-hmm. keep people out. They didn't build something to be the aggressor or the attacker, which a lot of times football is. And so very early on that was uh, displayed because some of the kids, uh, we would do a tackling drill and they'd say, well, they'd say, we'd be like, well, hit him. And they'd say, well, I don't want to. He's my friend, you know. And we said, no, no, it's okay. Um, and so you had to do, you had to kind of lo- teach them that it was okay to do that It was okay to be competitive against your friend. You could knock him down and you could pick him up. And I'll tell you this, um, you know, there was, there was a lot of things and we had an absolute blast. We all learned from each other. They housed us. They made sure that we were housed with the Chinese national. So you didn't have a choice. I mean, you were gonna, you were gonna get, uh, get well indoctrinated in there pretty fast, but I'll tell you this, those players over there picked up, one of the tougher games physically and mentally faster than I think a lot of people would pick up anything like Mm -hmm. to, I know they had had some experience and some coaching, but to watch the maturation process over the six game season that we had, I mean, some of those guys you were thinking they are they're If you didn't know where they were, where they were from and they just had the helmet on and say, no, that's a football player for sure. And uh, it was impressive. It was really impressive and somewhat rewarding to go over there and actually kind of, kind of teach them and help them out. What uh, out of everything that you did in China? It's the last thing I ask about China because, as I said, it could be a whole other podcast. But what what's the one thing you're going to remember the most? I mean, yes, you guys, you, you you did you did fairly well. You were the starting quarterback. Uh, it was a weird type of of season, so to speak, because it's not like your typical season that we have here over here in North America. It was like a one city, one game type of thing. And you didn't really have a home town, so to speak. I think it was one home game you did. Yeah. What, what's the one thing you're going to take away from that experience of yours? Well, appropriate or not, the uh, besides what I told you as far as the relationships with, with those kids and, and a lot of those things, if you want to talk about the one experience, um, probably would have been the brewery tour we took in Qingdao. Okay. Uh, there was about 10 or 12 of us and just that was the first time we ventured out and said we're not gonna we we offered we said to some of the guys he said do you want to go and no one wanted to go 
that spoke uh, Mandarin. And we said, you know what? We can do this. We've been here three weeks, uh, maybe a month even at that point. We're like, we can do this. We're going to... Um, we're going to do it. We're going to take, get in the cabs. We're going to navigate uh, through the language barrier. And it ended up being, uh, I'll just tell you the, the end of the night ended up where there was a line of people outside this um, patio at this, at this bar, this brewery lined up to take pictures with us, uh, do Instagram posts, Facebook posts. It, it was uh, cause we looked, we felt like rock stars for a little bit. Yeah. Um, but it's there's a lot of story in between there. But at the end of it, you know, the fact that we navigate it and that you gave you a new appreciation. You're like, geez, this, um, you know, when I see someone else ever in America struggling with the language or trying to some, figure something out, I will never turn the other way on them. I will help them out because this was uh, this was difficult. How um, wh- why didn't you play in the AFL in 2016? Um, so that was the year that uh, I went to Baltimore, and I'd been talking again. Scott Bailey was there, and he had called me all year, and he said, we've, you know, where are you? I said, Scott, I never let it go. I mean, I still throw every now and again. I was um, uh, playing in a flag football league. You can't let it go. And I, he said, well, we, you know, could you come back if we needed you? And I said, you know, with my job and everything, it might be tough, but I can't let it go. So if there's an opportunity, yeah. And then uh, towards the end of the year, um, Shane Carden was the uh, starter there in Baltimore, got hurt, and Shane Boyd was the backup. They said, look, we can't go into the last game of the year in the playoffs with one quarterback. So if you are feeling it, if you're in shape, we'd love for you to come out here and uh, you know, and be on the roster here towards the tail end of the year. And like I said, you never can let it go. None of us can let it go. You know, That's why coaches step in at practices now because – there's just there's just something about it, um, and that's where I was. I, I wanted a chance, and obviously I wanted to help them out also because Scott and um, Coach House was out there. You know, had really become good friends of mine, and I respected them like crazy. And so they said we could use you, and I thought absolutely. And so to get back around the guys and get back around it, uh, I'll never say no to that opportunity. Yeah, it, it must have been uh, you know twenty. You know, 2017 was, I don't know how to, how to describe the, the, the 2017 season, but um, I remember watching the one game and considering how well Shane Carden was. I mean, he was, I think at the, at the time, I think he was, you know, he could have basically a lock for rookie of the year. Um, I remember watching that broadcast, I think that you're talking about, just seeing you sit behind the bench and I'm thinking, a, a, a gentleman like you, your stature in the AFL, I felt you deserved. I felt you deserved so much more. Well, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I really do appreciate that. Hopefully, I wasn't pouting or showing anything because I was. Um, again, I, I think that was maybe the culmination of that chapter in my mind uh, of that part of the journey, like I was talking about. Where yeah. you know, again, it was another opportunity. I had been a starter for many years. Um, and it, you're not trying to be too philanthropic where you're saying, well, I'm going to give back. Um, part of me was for, for Scott Bailey and coach house, um, because they needed me there. But, uh, part of it was, uh, you know, you selfishly wanted to play also, you want to get back out there and throw at least one more touchdown, um, and do that. But I I looked at it as, um, I kind of took it as a compliment. Uh, you know, I felt like the old Wiley veteran who you say, man, this guy, it doesn't matter if he's still on the couch, we're still going to turn to him if we need him. And so, uh, I guess I, I took it as a, as a really big compliment from them. Uh, but yeah, it was tough. In fact, the playoff game, Shane Boyd played really well up in Philadelphia. Um, but he got right at the end, he had hurt his shoulder and, I didn't want him to get hurt, but I was kind of hoping to go in the last series, um, you know, just to get out there one more time. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and I didn't, and I thought, you know what, that's okay. Um, you know, still got to see the guys be around it. Um, and it, it kind of was, again, I would go back to what happened, but if that's the last time I suit him up, um, that's okay. Cause it's like, you, again, you, you just looked at, you say, I was the respected guy that they said, no matter what day, what time, we can call this guy off the couch and 
he may not wear a cape and he may have a cane now, but he'll he'll answer the call if needed. Didn't didn't at one point in your career? Because I know at one point in career, I think it was was it on actually on, on national TV? Did did Jerry Curtis call you America's quarterback? Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I believe it was Evan who worked in the front office, uh, and I want to say it was 2012. That was also the year that they were making a pitch to have me be on The Bachelor. Uh, because somebody in the league office, and might have been Evan, knew one of the producers of the show, and okay. they said, "Is there, you know, a guy that we could put up there and and trust and do a background check, and who's single?" And um, so, yeah, Evan kind of started that and said, "This is America's quarterback," and that was a pretty cool. Um, that was a really cool nickname, uh, one that you said, well, I don't want to take that lightly because they, they're not just talking about anything you do on the field. They're talking about how you carry yourself off the field uh, and with your teammates and in the community. Yeah. So I really liked that. You know, you try not to be too prideful, but I really liked that name because of what it represented. Um, the only bad thing was it never came to fruition. I never got on The Bachelor and, uh, well, still single now. So uh, we, we just fell short on that one. Well, you know what? It's funny because as fans, and we heard Jerry, I think Jerry mentioned it on, on, on television, Commissioner Kerr's on TV, we had no context. And we're like, where is this coming from? Because I don't think there are any, because this is the first time I'd heard about it, because I don't watch The Bachelor. You'd been on The Bachelor. Of course, I would have watched it. <laughs> See, but, and they, and they, we need to tell them. I, hate, I don't even know which network it's on, but that whatever network is missing out on a good solid fan base if we could find a, a viable candidate for it yeah so i i, I didn't I, I didn't know now and say like i said if, if i'm able to allow our listeners to learn one new thing hey it's something at least gives more context to at least we have something else that we learned about the league itself yeah our players was involved yeah. um what made you finally walk away jj um after so talking about that baltimore uh game it you know, I kind of walked off the field and uh, you'd been there. Like you said, you didn't play. You could see the young talent coming up. Kids like Shane Carden and some of these other kids, um, you know, Sean Brackett, Warren Smith. You saw these younger guys and you kind of realized that the the sand is running out at some point. Now, that being said, you don't want it to. Um, but it was uh, kind of a nice shift because the next year there was, you know, just a few teams in the league. Didn't get a call right away, and I think a lot of teams knew I was working, but um, the calls that I did get were to be an announcer and to get into broadcasting. And so it kind of I took it as a sign that that was the natural progression. You either get into coaching uh, or you you stay around the game one way or the other. So um, I kind of realized, I said, all right, maybe this is uh, the path that I'm going to take. I, I enjoy the broadcasting. I can offer some insight. Yeah. Um, and so – Though I'd much rather be on the field with the guys and I'd much rather be on the plane and the bus rides and the hotels, um, that's where we're at in our career. Uh, you kind of have to come to that realization that it, and that acceptance period. And I did and uh, could not have been uh, happier, though, that the AFL felt that I would be qualified to represent them you know, as a broadcaster and to do the Arena Bowl uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so it it made that transition much easier than I know a lot of guys go through. Uh, but for me, I was just thrilled to do that. And I just, it was kind of that feeling, you know, you say, well, this is the direction. This is kind of the, all the signs of where everything's going. And so this is the next chapter for me. So how did you, how did you get into it? Because, you know, you, I don't, you know, as far as I know, you don't have a background in broadcasting. You're a football player other than being on the, your, uh, uh, the, the kiss of reality show. Yeah. <laughs> um, how did you get into it? Because I remember seeing you pop up on the AFL network and I was like, you know, it was you and we had a couple of the other guys come finally come back because we needed the faces of the AFL show up because that's what needed to promote the league. You can't have somebody can learn the game, but you guys have the experience. Mm -hmm. How did you get into the broadcasting portion? I had mentioned it to some folks that I had some interest because I had done it a little bit when I was injured way back in the quad cities and, uh, on the radio and a few people said that's your next calling they said we really enjoyed listening to you break down the plays but make it simple for us and they said that's what you should do yeah. and uh so i just i mentioned it to some people and then they made kind of the offer and the opportunity arose and uh kind of a natural progression and then you know i've just enjoyed it like crazy because it it keeps me in the game one way or another mm-hmm 
Did you uh, ever reach out? Because obviously we know the quarterback is Ari Wolford column. Sid Bonner has been doing broadcasting for quite a while, and you, I think you guys are in the same state. So, I mean, it's do you, did you, did you reach out to Sid to see, get some oh, pointers yeah. and stuff like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, he and Ari Wolf, um, uh, Lou Tilly, uh, were were instrumental. And John Meter Perel and I worked mm-hmm. some games together. Um, Mick Moninghoff, who was a, a sportscaster in one of the towns I was at, he and I did some games, you know, uh, in a league there. And so I had some great people who have done this a long time, uh, kind of helping me and support me. Said obviously was one of them. He was my coach in Chicago in 2011. That's right. Yeah. So I had a, a natural rapport with him. So yeah, I had. Uh, plentiful resources to uh to try and make sure i didn't look too silly uh, on air there so we know you're involved in the what currently is and as far as we know will be the final season of the arena football league with you being the broadcaster what um what what did you see or, or hear that you felt that uh you you, you possibly saw what was going to be coming with them folding um, possibly for the last time the i hope not i really hope not mm-hmm. but um just the the lack of ownership numbers um good owners uh you know ted leonis there um but you only had a few of them and again same things i'd heard there was rumblings about who had money who was going to be able to do what and so i i knew it um you know i saw the attendance in a couple of the cities a couple of the games and it's too bad because it's a wonderful game. It allows a lot of guys to play. Any fan who goes is hooked. They'll mm-hmm. all tell you that. They say, I'm hooked. I will go. I can spend $15 to go watch a movie where I know at the end what's going to happen. Uh, or I come to this. It's unscripted. Uh, my kids will be absolutely floored with entertainment. I get to see some really quality athletes. Uh, the atmosphere is electric. And this is second to none as far as uh, experiences I've had all encompassing when you factor in everything. So really sad, but, um, I had heard some of the things, some of the things for a long time that I knew were going to be detrimental when you got down there a number of teams. And ultimately it, it appears for hopefully just the short term that that is the case. Yeah. Um, looking back at your career, um, yes, we know, you, you know, you didn't win a championship as you mentioned before. Um, you played for quite a few teams. I mean, first, would you call, would you have called yourself a journeyman? <laughs> you know, I, everyone else did. And uh, I remember <laughs> being introduced to, on a couple of games on the TV copies as a journeyman. Uh, so, yeah, some people look, put a negative connotation on it. I don't. Um, because it, uh, I just tell, I joke with people, I say, uh, I may not have been very good, but I was so popular, everyone at least wanted to play have me play for them or play with me at one point. So I yeah. just, you know, made my way around. So, yeah, you could probably say journeyman. Yeah. Um, any regrets that you have from your career? Obviously, I, I, obviously not winning a championship because that's the goal of all athletes is to win a championship. But do you have any regrets? No, none. Uh, and from a – because I realized there was the controllables that I had, which was um, I wanted to lift every weight, watch every minute of the film, uh, run every sprint, run every hill, uh, not leave anything on the table – as far as my preparation and how I approached it. And if that had been the case, if I had uh, looked back and said, man, there was a lot of times I went and did this, or I went to the pool and did that or whatever. And I, I can honestly tell you um, that no, I, I, I have, I have some um, disappointment that we didn't make it as far, like we alluded to. Uh, But certainly the word regret, I, I, knew going through it i never wanted that to be something that came into my vocabulary and reflecting on my career and i can tell you fortunately that just a few years removed it's it's certainly not at this point so let's say somebody let's say the arena football league doesn't come back okay um it, it's never reborn it, it, we're all now a part of history um somebody comes up to you and asks you they, they were searching through wikipedia or whatever and they and they learned about the afr they saw something on youtube what are you going to tell them about the AFL? Well, if I have the old cliche in sales, the elevator pitch, um, I'm going to tell them it was real football. It was really, really talented players that could have played on Sundays uh, in the NFL. Um, 
but it was football with a twist. And the best part about it and all the people that were involved, it allowed a lot of us to, like I said earlier, not just pursue the dream, but continue living the dream. Um, it was a legitimate game and it was the best 12 years of my life and the most fun I ever had. I, I, I look at everybody that I'm speaking with, not only through this historical pod, but everybody that I met, um, all of us fans too, fans, sex, fans, we're all part of that one big group, JJ of the hashtag arena football family. Yep. That's something nobody will ever be able to take that away from you. It's a one, it's a family that people may not ever know about because if you're not a, if you're not an athlete, you don't know the bonds. No, as you said, you've mentioned so many people that you have, have now have friends that you have, you know, throughout your career and that you have, that they're currently friends now. Um, all, all I can say is, um, luckily, me being as I was a part of the family stuff in such a way, I am proud to know you. I am proud of what you did during your career, and um, I, I, I really enjoyed what you did during your time in the AFL. Well, I appreciate it, Tim, and you, you nailed it uh, on the head. I, uh, I remember being at one of the induction ceremonies uh, for the Hall of Fame, and. Uh, Afterwards, my folks were actually there for it. And afterwards, my dad said the exact same thing. He said, Jay, he said, you know, I, I know everyone wants to make it to the NFL. I know that you want to get to that level and, and it's the top. He said, but what you're doing is so cool. And he said, this is such – everyone who plays in the Arena League, this is such a close-knit group. He said, you guys are one gigantic family. And anyone who's been a part of it as a player, a coach, a fan, uh, a trainer, an equipment manager, a strength coach – is is all part of it and you guys could run into each other and if it if you either recognize each other or came up and you guys would have this instant bond and he said this is one of the coolest things ever we'd like to thank jj for joining us on the podcast this episode as you're able to see you know even a player like himself who played for so many teams whether it was through free agency or being traded he loved every minute of it, and uh, that that those are the type of stories that we love to hear. No matter if you play with one team in your career, or if you play with you know, seventeen or eighteen teams, whatever it is, you know, within your career itself. Uh, if you have missed any of the previous episodes of the podcast, uh, you can find them in a couple of places, so you can make sure that you get caught up. Uh, if you head over to SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio and our audio version over on you. If you have any suggestions on who you'd like us to try and get for a future episode, you can email us at aflrewind at arenafan.com. So we'd like to thank you for joining us for this episode. Just want to make sure that everybody stays safe. Please do your part, whether that be staying inside, washing your hands, wearing a mask, whatever it is, we just want you all to stay healthy. So for everybody here at AFL Rewind, I'm Tim Capper. Watch the rebound off the net. Thank you.